and what I feel like is this liberal myth that the civil rights movement was just a lot of polite black people in their in their church clothes or uh, walking up and down the street thanking with the police for not bopping them on the head while they protest and then all of a sudden uh john f kennedy signed the the civil rights bill and then slavery ended and uh <laughs> then martin luther king rose on the third day after the i have a dream speech you know like it's <laughs> This mythology yeah. um, that, you know, again, and that I have been disabusing myself of within the last couple of years, right? Uh, one of the, shout out to Storyteller, who was probably one of the first people who I saw make a video about it, where he talked about uh, Malcolm X's, the circus came in speech, mm -hmm. um, where he talks about how, you know, Negroes was putting hands on people, and then they called MLK to come and kind of like smooth things out. Um, so it's this conversation around not just MLK, because I think it's fair to say that ML, it's obvi obviously MLK promoted nonviolence in his work, but people make that a moral thing instead of a strategic thing. And there's a lot of stuff there. So I'm, I'm going to let you run with like, like, what are we missing? What is, how does that myth work and why is it so prominent in certain spaces? So <clears throat> immediately after this, I'm going to get out of your chat, but I just want to quickly point out I'm not I'm not suffering by any means, but this is green screen, everybody. This is this is not this is I appreciate it might have fooled somebody, but this is not my house. Okay. It's, you, it is, you know, it's rich, yeah. rich champagne socialists with our degrees. <laughs> so I'm not oh, suffering Lord. like that, but this is green screen. Anyway. <laughs> so first thing I always like to 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 the more and more so uh as 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 time goes, I like to remind folks that that most of our conclusions about what we think about the world have been manufactured with great amount of effort and resource and organization by those in power. So there's been a lot of effort for a long time, a lot of resource, a lot of study into how to do it, uh, uh, to create a version in our minds of the world and of a history that that is not necessarily true. Uh, du Bois once called it the propaganda of history. Um, that he and his work was looking to struggle against in terms of the depiction of black people, for instance. But so part of that is 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 what part of what that does is it it it, it uh, uh, leads us to some of the conclusions that you've you've sort of just I think humorously but unfortunately accurately had us you know. So speaking of Du Bois, as a Du Boisian. King picked up a number of things, including initially Du Bois' own willingness to engage in armed self-defense. If people may not remember, but during the so-called Atlanta riots, Du Bois was clear. And he said, I went out on my porch with a shotgun and said, the first white man that steps on my property is getting shot. King himself, not only adapting more and more of Du Bois' socialism as he grew, but was himself willing uh, to to engage in armed self-defense and it was the movement around him that encouraged him to to maintain both a practice and a, a preach of nonviolence. so we have to understand that that some of what we end up hearing even from the great dr king is a tactic uh even as he discusses later in, in his engagement with black power and an increasing militant militantism to me, the reading is very clear. He's he's not saying necessarily that uh, revolutionary violence has no value. He's he's more tactically saying we can't engage in armed conflict with this state. So we need other ways to do it. So in other words, it's not to say nonviolence is 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 right or wrong per se, but we have to recognize that that uh, for King and others, it was a tactic, not just some unending. And King was also very clear that in saying that, uh, in quoting John F. Kennedy, that those who make nonviolent revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Right. And what he was pointing to was a long, long history going back to the human beginnings. Whenever you oppress people, there will be revolutionary violence employed by those being oppressed to free themselves. There is zero exception to this. It's just a matter of how successful or how it's been interpreted or carried out. That is the only difference. So uh, uh, as it goes, it pertains to the civil rights struggle, there, there, there has been, or black history in general, or all histories really, there has been a decided 
interest among those in power uh, and a lot of work put to this end to make sure that if revolutionary violence is referenced at all, it's done, it's depicted as negative, as ineffective, as inappropriate. Uh, and to maintain the monopoly of violence that those in power want to maintain, they have to always depict uh, the military or the police or, or, or state violence as acceptable. Armed struggle in response is never acceptable, always inappropriate and immature or childish at best. So I'll stop with this answer here and, and I'm happy to follow. But, but by saying, as I would say always and again, increasingly so, I always encourage people more and more. Ask yourself whether you would acknowledge the answer openly or not. How much do I really know about this subject? Have I really read Dr. King? Have I read his work? Have I read the work about him? Have I read about the civil rights struggle? Who am I getting my information from? Uh, because as I've as I've said to you, doc, and I say all the time, Dr. King is is the most known and least understood figure in human history, second maybe only to the historical Jesus Christ, and I mean that literally. I, he is more known and misunderstood than I think anybody, maybe other than Jesus, and and um, uh, uh, and I think that's a, a good sort of symbol for what we don't understand about Black history and, and, and much of history in general. Yeah, that's and that's kind of like. The frustrating thing is as you develop, as I develop this platform and I hear certain things, I see people's tweets about Dr. King would, wouldn't want this. Actually, it, it is funny. This came from uh, an individual who's being, you know, uh, uh, pilloried for recent transgressions of varying levels ex explicitly around trans issues and kind of this like presenting trans revolutionary action or trans like uh even just trans protests as like going too far and i'm thinking to myself first off i don't know any situations where they've like really gave back what they've been getting um but it also and then it's like and then you're gonna toss in mlk so you're gonna like use mlk to stamp down on other people's revolutionary action it's like a it's like a triple sandwich of of nonsense and it's and it it flies because people don't know, not not just don't know, are comfortable in that ignorance around uh, the history. Um, another thing you said that I thought was interesting is the uh, the media's role in this. And one thing, uh, so so me and Dr. Ball, my, one of my you know one of my favorite movies of all time is, is Black Panther, the first one. Um, Dr. Ball, as you can see, <laughs> his facial expression. It's not a fan and we've had some conversation around it. Not I, I don't I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, you know, and it's not to say I disagree with your critiques. Your critiques are spot on. I have I have really nothing uh to offer. One thing and one thing I really I, I didn't mention in the video I did about it that you brought to my attention and then you talked about it again with the woman king. Um, and then you talked about it historically in the media is the absence of uh, violence against colonial imperial power in our media. Um, even going into like um, like uh, depictions of like in, in Judaism and the Holocaust and like, uh, you, you know, people like my understanding of the Holocaust is that, you know, the Germans and the Nazis just came and rounded up Jews and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you pointed out in one of your, your uh, one of your talks about how like there was significant violent resistance against Nazis by Jewish people, and you will never see that in our media. Um, even to get, even in, even in a situation where it's like that would be an easy, like aside from I guess uh, Inglorious Bastards, which is you know uh, pure fiction, that seems like it would be an easy thing to sell to the media, but it still doesn't happen because we have to maintain this veneer of civility and peace under oppression. I think about have you seen the last Spider Man movie? The, the the black spider-man the movie? second no the spider verse i haven't seen the second spider verse you should so. check it out it's yeah. got it's 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 got me feeling excited but also scared because it does a lot of things that i'm like okay y'all y'all are really trying to hit the mark but i i just feel like there's no way you're gonna follow through on it um mm. but they have the first ever depiction of a black anarchist that is mm. not of, of an anarchist first off a black anarchist period but then an anarchist who isn't played for a comedy and shown as like, this is extreme. Um, his name is Hobie. He's a uh, spider punk. He's punk Spider-Man, punk rock Spider-Man. And he's the most important and righteous character in the film. 
just very on the low, very subtly. Hmm. Um, and you know, I'm like, are y'all, what are y'all doing there? Who, who's writing this? Who's in the room? Cause I'm not used to seeing any depiction of punks as anything other than like ridiculous over the top caricatures that want to break stuff for no apparent reason. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's that part of it is really interesting to me that, you know, uh, the absence of certain images of, and I want to be clear as, as I, as I have various watchers, uh, I do. I try not to promote uh, violent action from a, a standpoint of ethics. Because one, we on, we're on YouTube, and two, I haven't thrown any bricks, and I have no, I have no plans of, of hitting the streets with anybody. And so, like when you got a, a megaphone and you talk a certain way, you need you need to talk in a way that you can back up. Is my is my opinion. But I also find myself frustrated with the way that conversation goes and how people it's like, it's one thing to say, I'm not going to involve myself in the conversation is another thing to lie about what the conversation should really be about. Right. So first, I, you know, one, I think it's always important. We have to remember what media are and how they function in, in any given society. And that's often misunderstood and that media are it's, and this is, this is as much as is possible in an objective fact, given uh, and you could just research the, the the field of mass communication itself and the, the the founders of the field. They were very explicit and continue to be very explicit that media and communication are meant to play a role in advancing state power, military, government, you know, those in power are that's what it's here for. And and the more I would also encourage an increased study in, in, in the history of propaganda, which this country has deployed to greater degree than any in, in, in any history in terms of the study and in deployment of it. Um, and under Obama made it legal to propagandize American citizens, but that was just another little thing that many people missed under his yeah. presidency. But the, my point is, is that, that entertainment is encouraged in terms of an, uh, an interpretation among audiences, because when we think something is just entertainment, we're less likely to be critical of it. Uh, so, so, so I, I just like, like to throw a little bit of, of attention to that before we move anywhere else. And so building from that, and I'm happy to come back to any of this with more detail if we have time, but, but, uh, building from that, um, and sort of making uh, light of it to a certain extent, based on an old friend of mine with, with the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance, the, the point is, is that we is to be very critical of media in this context that is producing something that we like or find interesting or that reflects ourselves. Because I think more than ever, we are living at a time where anything can be discussed, but it's the frame and the interpretation is getting much more sophisticated to your point. And I think you're right to be a little cautious, like, wait a minute, whenever I see a film do something that I really enjoy or I appreciate, I start to get a little nervous. Like you're saying, like, what are you really doing here? So for instance, in terms of, I haven't seen the film, but if folks are interested in, 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 in just to combine some of these topics in, in uh, black anarchism, and this is not anywhere near my field of expertise. My question initially was, was, as you were talking was to what extent does it point people to the likes of Ashanti Alston? You know, who the former Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army member, who's a current uh, active black anarchist um, arguing and advocating for that. What does it mean to. Uh, um, and again, to your point, it's not to say I'm certainly not advocating any of that activity. It's to say we cannot whether we whether. Uh, however comfortable or not we feel about it, we can't ignore that the historical reality of a black liberation army, of armed struggle in any society. We can't ignore the history of Russell Maroon Schultz, who just passed away recently as a, as a member of the black liberation army and po former political prisoner who wrote in one of his books or, or made the great point that the, the opposite of violence is not nonviolence. Nonviolence is the absence of violence. The absence of something is not its opposite. Its opposite is counterviolence. So again, in his point, even in his book, was not necessarily to advocate it, but to make the point to, to help people understand why would rational, thinking, committed, loving people, George Jackson said his, his anger with the world came from a profound love of people and life 
And when he saw the intentional imposition of inequality, he became hostile to that reality, as as I think we we are logically right to do. Yeah. So it's to say, not necessarily, again, we're not, I'm not advocating, I'm not doing any of this, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just simply saying that, that, but as a historian or someone who cares about history, wants to understand our current environment, as, as, as someone who wears an Asada Shakur t-shirt and sees people constantly wearing shirt, Asada taught me, there's that, well, what right. did she teach you? Right. Because she consciously engaged in armed struggle. Now, was that because she was and is still living in Cuba? Is, is, is there something wrong with her? Or was what was the reason why, again, a loving, intelligent, committed, decent human being would put themselves in that level of risk? And what was the value that they thought was, you know? So in other words, these are the things that have to be, I think, better understood and, and, and considered, even as we maybe, you know, go in other directions politically.